This is Captain's Log with your host, Captain Mark Gray. Welcome aboard. Sea tales are true stories with a safety message. They may save your life or that of a loved one. And we're going to have three sea tales for you next. My sea tales guest today is Mr. Tony Clinch. Welcome aboard, sir. Mark, welcome to you. Uh, I understand that you have a brief boating history that you could tell us about. Uh, I know you have several years in boating, but could you give us a brief history? Basically, I was in power for years, and then for the last 15 years, cruising the islands here, we went to sail. And just recently, we went back to power. So uh, that really, in a nutshell, is what it is. And this, this is your boat now, and what kind of boat is this? This is a Hatteras, a Hatteras. sports fisher, 37 feet, and um, designed really to get out to the fishing grounds and then to get back mm -hmm. in the same day. This right. I understand you have a sea tale for us. That's a true story with a safety message. Yeah. Could you tell us that? Mark, um, in, in the spring of 86, I had a sailboat. And a young friend of mine and myself were coming back down from Santa Barbara. And the conditions were very calm in the morning. And we didn't have any power, by the way. And progressively during the day, they started to worsen. Um, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, off of Rincon, in conditions that basically are, they were not threatening conditions, but they were challenging. Uh, I went midships to lower the mainsail. One of the reasons is I really don't believe in, in reefing the mainsail, but I wanted to lower it and get it out of the way. For our non-boating friends, could you explain midships and reefing real well, briefly? Midships is where the mast is located on the mm -hmm. boat, and the halyards that control the, ma that control the mainsail mm -hmm. are at that point mm -hmm. in the vessel. And I went forward, I and, lowered the mainsail. And reefing would be the little points halfway down the sail where you can take it halfway down and tie it off. And tie it so off. So you don't have as much sail up. That's for correct. heavy winds. So. Yeah. But anyway, I've, I've never been one for reefing at all. And these conditions certainly didn't warrant reefing. They warranted getting rid of the mainsail. When the mainsail came down, I was furling it. And we had pulled the sheet tight. And I was lying on the boom, braced against the cabin top. And what happened, the gooseneck slipped another eight inches or so. With that, the boat slalomed off a wave. And the boom went out over the ocean. And I was caught on the boom and the sail unfurled, and I was dropped into the water. It was amazing to me that I was dropped into the water that fast. I really couldn't believe it. Fortunately, I did have a harness on, and I was tied to the jack line. Jack lines are the lines that you strap around a sailboat so that you can walk up without taking your harness on and putting it off at various intervals. I broke the stanchion, and I almost broke my shoulder with the weight of the water and the weight of the boat. What was amazing was that my legs were caught in the flow of the water, which was sucking them down. When the boat lurched back towards the port, my legs came free and I was able to vault back on the boat. Ironically, I almost vaulted over the boat again because I was running with such adrenaline. I came back and I got back on board. Thank God the helmsman hadn't been able to see me with the sail and with the dodger. The, I broke the dodger with the weight of my body uh, and did considerable damage. I was quite surprised. The main factor was that I was harnessed and, and that was a life saving. I was not in a life jacket and I should have been. I should have been when the conditions had gotten to that, that point. Um, we continued home back into Channel Island Harbour and on the way because we cut into the beach too soon. We actually arrived too close to shore too soon, down around the um, Edison plant that's off the Mandalay Beach. The electric plant. The electric yeah. plant. What happened then was we had to cut back out to see to get some ground room because we were, in the, we were coming in too close to the shore. At that point, we were at a danger of being rolled in terms of being hit by a beam sea. We had lost the advantage of being further out and coming in at a quartering sea. On one occasion, we took a wave full on the beam and it flooded the cockpit. That's I mean, right over the side of the boat. And came right in over the side. Actually, not of the boat it itself, but of the cockpit. Mm -hmm. The one interesting thing that I discovered when that occurred, I had already put in the companionway slats or the washboards, if you would. Mm -hmm. The cockpit filled up to the brim. 
and I mean it really did, it filled up completely. Fortunately, when your cockpit fills and you do have that reserve buoyancy underneath the, the, uh, the cockpit with the airspace of the engine and the lazarettes, you keep sufficient buoyancy that your vessel won't go down. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't matter if you take a second wave at that point or not because so much water is that, it's just so much water. Um, it drained, it probably only took three minutes to drain, but it honestly felt like it would never drain out of there. Finally it drained and that was that. Was that. The conditions that prevail out here are truly very seldom widow-making conditions. In fact, in 15 years of sailing the islands, we've had three periods when we've had bad storms. On one occasion, which were the winds of November, we had enormous winds come through in November 76 on Thanksgiving. We had an enormous toll in boat damage, but we never lost a life. Now that really was attributable to the Coast Guard. What's important about that is for people to realize that the conditions that really cost lives or cause accidents are normally challenging conditions. They're not horrendous conditions, because most often people aren't out in horrendous conditions. If you take your challenging conditions, if you go to life jackets, if you go to harnesses, if you secure your cabin and secure everything on the vessel, when conditions are beginning to worsen, you honestly will never have a problem with the sea. If you don't, you're going to have an enormous problem. So it all goes back to having the proper equipment and using it when the conditions weren't that. And Absolutely. people can fall overboard in a pretty calm day. You'll never it get them back happen. once they do. You just will and never get them back. I mean, yeah. you can hit them on the head and kill them, bringing your boat up to try to retrieve them. Mm -hmm. So the best thing is harness them onto the boat, put on their life jackets, and have available a knife, incidentally. Should you have a need to get rid of, of the harness so you can slit the string or the line that's attaching it, because you need that accessibility to being able to free yourself from the boat. However, um, so you should have a little jackknife, or I know in the military we use switchblades. Um, actually, a straight knife is probably yeah. the best. If you're trying to get hold of a switchblade and open yeah. it up at that well, moment, that, we use it because you can do it with one hand. As you said, you injured your shoulder, you know, yeah. and you could open that with one hand, but they're hard to come by. Um, but that's that's a very important thing, you know, and it's a good sea tale, a good safety story. And on that note, I'm going to have to say that we'll be back with another story. And uh, I did want to ask The Captain's Log is like no other ship's logbook you'll find in the world today. It's unsurpassed in quality and workmanship. Created from scratch, its 400 pages are divided into 19 sensible, practical, and easy-to-use chapters, each tab for convenient access. Beautifully illustrated throughout with 23 original pen and ink drawings, the Captain's Log is full of fresh new ideas. This is the first logbook ever published with two cruising formats, one for day cruises and another for long passages. Other unique selections include Stores Ledger, Cruising Friends, Diagrams, Separate Repair and Maintenance Chapters, and the box is much more. You can now document a wealth of valuable information in one big, beautiful book. And whether your edition graces your coffee table or stows in its own log keeper, you will have a handsome and lasting record of your vessel and all your cherished memories aboard her. Also designed for carrying the captain's log and your other valuable ship's documents, passports and boat keys, the Sea Brief is water resistant and will float with all its contents. The captain's log is the perfect christening gift and perhaps the end of your frustrating search for the ultimate ship's logbook. Blending comfort, performance and value, Catalina Yachts continue a tradition of building outstanding sailboats in every class. Sail the Catalina 30 and experience this successful combination of a modern, efficient hull shape with spacious accommodations that create the perfect balance in a modern racer cruiser. America's largest sailboat manufacturer invites you to call a Catalina yacht dealer in your area today. My next Sea Tales guest is Mr. Ron Hillblum. Welcome aboard, sir. My pleasure. Uh, could you briefly tell us a little bit about your boating history? 
Well, it seems like we've been boating ever since I met my wife. We've owned several boats, and we uh, currently have a trawler. And probably we've gone through about four or five boats and done a lot of uh, water skiing and that type of boating. But it found, we found that uh, uh, boating in the salt water was a year-round activity. And that's uh, what we really uh, enjoy. enjoy. Uh -huh. So we, we, we say we have 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Uh, I understand you have a sea tale for us, a true story with a safety message. Yes, when we first started uh, cruising on the salt water, we found a situation where we performed a rescue at sea. And we found that we really weren't prepared and it caused us to examine you know, the, our preparedness. So uh, that's a tale I'd like to tell you about. Mm -hmm. OK, would you please? OK. Uh, it's, when we first started uh, boating, we started off uh, enjoying the boat. And uh, one day we were out uh, fishing out uh, Anacapa Island. And it was one of those nice days, and we caught a, a fair number of fish. And, uh, you know, boating was going well, it was good weather, just very enjoyable. So later in the day, we started back. And still things going very well, and uh, my wife is driving the boat. And I was on the back of the boat working away, cleaning up some fish. And fortunately, she was listening to the radio and heard a, a, a mayday for help. And uh, started looking around. And uh, she happened to see the boat that was in question, which turned out to be a sailboat. And it actually sank. She saw the boat sink right in front of her eyes at a distance about a couple miles. And so we're, we're sitting here wondering what's going to happen, you know, she's up there and I'm in the back. And so she has to get my attention and appear like we're the only boat nearby. So we're forced to do the rescue of that sailboat. And so we proceeded in that direction. And uh, fortunately, the people had gotten off the boat and uh, a lot of debris in the water. And we came up upon them and uh, now we had the problem of uh, getting them out of the water. And my wife felt very uncomfortable driving the boat. I felt very uncomfortable her trying to drag somebody in uh, into our boat. And so this is the first quandary that we really ran across, is that we, we were not prepared. And so uh, fortunately, we did get the uh, uh, two guys that uh, were on the sailboat, brought them aboard, and then had to coordinate the rescue of them from the uh, Coast Guard which meant we had to call the Coast Guard, be prepared to give them proper directions, the destination, uh, where, to, where our location, where to travel to. Uh, and uh, that took a period of like 45 minutes or something like that. And we fortunately could see the Coast Guard boat and vectored them into our location. And one of the other interesting things you get into when you're sitting out there and another boat comes up to you, the Coast Guard boat, now you have to transfer personnel at sea. And we've never done this before. And we're sitting here, see how are we going to get these people off our boat now? And it was rough enough that you really didn't want another boat edging up to you too closely. But fortunately, their navigator was very good, and uh, we were able to get the boats close enough and uh, uh, get the gentleman transferred and help them with the description of the accident and, and that. But caused us to examine uh, just how prepared you are. What are the things that you really have to be prepared to do when you uh, encounter situations like that? Did you do any, like, uh, make a list, perhaps, of things, situations that might arise that you weren't prepared for, for after that, and then develop some kind of game plan? It wasn't so much uh, I'm actually making a list, but it did sit this thing down. The number one priority thing that uh, became evident to us is that the uh, handling, of the, my wife had to ha be able to handle the boat. And that's one of the f first things we worked on. We had to be, be very sure that we had the equipment available, primarily ropes and that type of gear available. And uh, any other flotation devices required uh, for that type of situation. Uh, also became very evident it was really necessary for my wife to develop the ability to handle the, the uh, ship to shore radio or the VHF radio. So she, we had to make sure that her comfort level was that she could handle it and, and not become confused and be able to talk to the Coast Guard in the event that I can, could not do that. And use the proper language on the, the radio proper language, and the proper, the proper information. proper protocol, 
uh, the ability to know where you are located because in the, these areas here that we often have cloudy um, um, uh, weather you can't really see uh, the distances are very deceiving and so uh, uh, either she had to learn how to the, use the equipment or, and or we had to keep a, a, a constant log so we knew where we were at any one point in time so we could transmit, to, transmit that to whoever was interested. But when you're in a boat with just two people, which is most of the time, it really becomes uh, uh, evident that you cannot uh, ignore a lot of skills. You really have to work and make sure that both people are very comfortable and they work together and that they have the ability to... A variety, to, a yes. variety of skills. Yeah. Uh, I believe that the Power Squadron and the Yacht Clubs put on what they call skipper-saver courses, where they teach the spouse, that you know, uh, yes. some and of these skills. being part of a, uh, in, involved in boating and in the Yacht Club, that's one of the things we're very much interested in doing. But uh, not only just the safety aspect, but just the whole comfort and fun at sea really depends on the uh, two working together. And th this is just one example in our early boating. And uh, later on, we found a lot of other examples. But one thing that I thought of in your story is that uh, when the boat was down, you said there was quite a bit of debris. Yes. When you're motoring through that debris, you know as well as I do, even this plastic bag, uh, the things from beer yeah. cans and uh, life jackets with That's little right. straps can get caught in your prop. Yeah. And so therefore, you've got to be very yeah. conscious and, uh, and alert of that, as well as the location of the people. Yeah, our major concern at that point was being able to get to the survivors, get them aboard with minimal effort and not uh, really causing them, you know, were getting in involved the, in the debris. How long would you say they were in the water? Before well, I would say the, in this particular case, which was very fortunate, uh, the survivors were probably in their 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's not too bad, but hypothermia can set in yes. within an hour or less, you know, usually an hour to three hours in our temperature. Yeah. And on that note, I'm going to have to thank you, sir. We'll be back with another Sea Tales guest right after this. Marina sailing, experience it. The vacation of a lifetime. Islands to explore, sheltered coves to discover, clear water to enjoy. You say you don't know how to sail? Well, that's okay because we've been teaching people to sail for over 25 years. In fact, we're California's oldest and largest sailing club with 70 boats and three locations to serve you. Come on down, take the challenge. We're Marina Sailing. Next Sea Tales guest is Mr. Ray Koalas. Welcome aboard, Ray. Mike, thank you very much. Hey. Uh, could you give us a brief boating history of yourself? Perhaps how many years you've been in boating and boats you own and what you own now? Okay, if you will, it goes back eight or nine years to Newport Harbor where I started uh, in ocean sailing at least with a 28-foot sailboat. Uh, prior to that, maybe a little inland lake sailing in 22, 24-foot vessel sailboats. and. Uh, Really cut my teeth on the 28-footer for seven years and just recently gravitated to a 41-foot uh, sail oh, uh, scepter. That'll keep you here. occupied. So it's keeping me busy indeed, yeah. yes. I understand that you have a sea tale for us, a true story with a safety message. Could you tell us that? Well, I'd be glad to uh, really, if you will, the, uh, the moral in advance is a, is a tale on boat handling. 
and better phrase on how I mishandled a vessel and learned from the experience, but it dates back into the early, early days of my experiences. And I think all of us as uh, boaters learn very quickly that a vessel will, particularly a single engine boat, whether it be power or sail, has unique handling characteristics and will back down in reverse, pulling strongly one way to port or to starboard, as the case may be. And I didn't learn until perhaps it was too late that a vessel will also in forward gear, forward thrust, will pull strongly to turn more sharply to port or to starboard, depending on the rotation of the propeller. But, no, uh, if the propeller's a right hand whether it's a right hand turning or propeller it'll or a left hand, it'll make the boat actually pull one way, and if it's a left hand, it'll make it go the other way. Correct. In my case, For our and little, boating little did I know at the time, my sailboat. Uh, and again, this is very early in my days of learning how to handle a, my vessel, but it turned on a dime quickly to, to starboard. To right, it would spin on a dime, and there was and. To port, it was a little slower turning, but it still had, because of its rudder characteristics, had very good turning capability. And I was making uh, a single-handed uh, voyage tape bearing the boat down to Dana Point from Newport Harbor once, the 28-footer. And uh, mistake number one, I had perhaps a one or two too many uh, potties on the way, and I perhaps was not at my best in judgment, and I admit that. And I, uh, I've since learned my lesson. But regardless, I, I found myself in a situation misjudging the height of a bridge in Dana Point Harbor. Mm. Ever, well, so many of us have been there. And discovered uh, perhaps a little too late that my 42-foot stick, or the height of my mast being 42 foot off the water, was not going to make it. Should have been early, uh, evident earlier. But when I discovered that, so I, your mast is 42 feet 42 out foot and, off, and, and I don't know what the isn't. vertical clearance of that particular mm -hmm. bridge was, but I suspect it's about 33 feet. Uh, it's, again, this has been eight years ago, so bear with me. But I uh, made the mistaken judgment of trying to go into reverse thrust and reverse the momentum of the vessel through reverse gear. And um, unless a, a boat with a single engine has some high-tech a high-tech propeller, uh, it does not have much capability of reverse thrust. And I not only made that mistake, rather than turning very quickly to right, to, to starboard, my boat would have clear, turned very quickly, spun on a dime, missed the bridge by 30, 40 yards, if not more. But I made the mistake of backing into reverse, the double mistake, if you will, of killing the engine, having to restart, and again, trying to accelerate in reverse and, and, and slow the boat, stop the boat down. And I was unable to do so. I went ahead, struck the bridge, caused some very minor damage. Uh, could, had it, it could have to been To the worse. boat or the to bridge? To the boat, <laughs> uh, not to the bridge. <laughs> and didn't hurt the bridge uh, a bit. And, and to my ego. It hurt my ego very, a great deal, but I lived that down, thank God. And uh, I learned from the experience, rather than, had I not gone into this reverse thrust, killed the engine, and tried to slow the boat or stop the boat. And of course, with no forward motion, you lose your steering that ability. Is correct as so, well. with the forward motion, you could have spun on a I, dime. And, I could have and spun left. the boat to starboard on a dime and, and had no complication in the world. And I was not, it's a combination of uh, misjudgment primarily and not knowing how the vessel would handle. So, again, I think my moral would be to, for every boater, whether it be uh, a charter boat or their own vessel to get it out in open water early and practice spinning, turning, finding out which direction their vessel uh, will turn the quickest, uh, backing down, finding, discovering early how much it will pull to port or to starboard, and learning the handling characteristics. And of so course, that, wind has a place well, a large factor. If they go out on a beautiful factor. calm day and then all of a sudden when they have to do it, there are 50 knot winds out there it's going to make a difference. Well, indeed, and invariably, it happens at the wrong time. Uh, so unless you try it first and practice and uh, get some experience under your belt, it's difficult in the emergency to think clearly and, and, and make the right judgment, which is so necessary to avoid difficulty and or uh, injury. So it should become second, you know, nature to you. You should not only learn how long it takes to do this and that with your boat, but you should do it frequently too. What I also do, once you're, you're familiar with it out in the ocean, you know, you can come into a large harbor area like this and pick some, you know, a point, reference points, 
to better see how far you drift and things of that sort. Well, it, or a buoy out in the ocean and practice on a buoy as if it's a slip. It's important to practice, number one, but invariably more of your boating accidents, from my perspective, happen in, in inner waters, in protected waters, and in congested areas. And, and this, if you will, is where the practice needs, you need to learn those handling characteristics so that you can avoid emergencies and, and defensive, if you will, drive defensive or pilot your vessel defensively. And uh, had I done so, I would have avoided some definite complications and uh, I feel, of, of, well, become well, a better mariner in the process. So. Also, when you, when you uh, buy a new boat, you should go through the whole routine again. I think that's awful important. It, a lot of people think, well, I know how to do that, yeah. but this is a new boat. And Every stuff. vessel is different. Yeah, whether it be sail, if, as long as it has a single engine, and a, it, the handling characteristics will be totally different, different on every vessel that. and uh, it has you have to get familiar with that particular vessel okay well I appreciate you being here this has been sea tales true stories that may save you some heartache or perhaps even your life and watch captain fly <laughs> thank you